Good evening. How is everyone? Great. great. John is great. Um, I'm really looking forward to bringing this word to you all tonight. Uh, when this topic was originally discussed um, by Jacob, uh, this whole series was discussed. The reality of the statement that we're going to be going through tonight has been very much a part of um, my life recently, um, my time with Jesus, my time with God, um, as well as in some of the, the books and the research that I've been looking at. So I'm looking forward to, to digging in and getting into this a little bit. Um, last week, you all got to hear from Wesley Huff, who brought us teaching around whether all religions lead to God. Um, my husband, Jeff, and I were taking a look at the podcast, and he was showing me that Wesley had just over an hour of speaking time. So I'm assuming that I get the same amount of time tonight. So as we get started, I want to take a look and center us around the statement that we'll be reviewing for this week. As Jacob mentioned at the beginning, this whole series in the summer is built upon a type of religion that in many ways I believe our current culture aligns with in respect, in one respect or another. We live in a time when God and scripture are being deconstructed to reflect personal views or feelings. This could look like what we see now and understand as progressive Christianity, potentially, or it could also just look like someone taking views from many religions and combining them to be their own truth. We've talked about who God is in the first session with Joel. Uh, we've talked about the difference between Christianity and other religions, and now we're going to be moving into happiness and satisfaction. So the sociologist who completed this study wrote this. Those who adhere to this type of religion believe that their goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about themselves. This really is something that we know to be of importance in our world. It's a motivator and it drives us. It's not just important because of the outcome of this study, showing us what those involved actually believe, but also to our current culture and many people that we have in our lives right now. This is also something that affects us potentially personally at different times or seasons in our life. So we're gonna chat for a minute um, about our current cultural moment. Um, we're gonna look at some phrases that tend to align with this creedal statement that we're going through this week. These are things that we hear on a consistent basis, either in conversations with friends or family, maybe a counselor, and definitely most likely on social, uh, which is the phrase the youth have for social media. Um, but these statements are often celebrated, and I would even go so far as to say is honored in our world. So here we go. The first one, you do you. I'm sure a lot of us have heard that before. You do you. You act, make decisions, speak in your own way, free of other considerations. Second one, the only opinion that matters is the opinion you have of yourself. You are the ultimate source of how you see yourself without any input from others. Number three, follow your own heart. I see this right now in the plethora of cartoons and Disney movies that are very much a part of my life. Um, the idea of following your true north um, or your heart's feelings. The last one, all that matters is if you're happy. Regardless of who this impacts, how it impacts our world or the other realities going on around you, it only matters if you're happy in it. And this is a lot of what we're going to be exploring tonight. So a few points about our talk before I actually get going. Um, I want to outline some things that I'm going to be building upon or my assumptions for this talk. I want to go through these because I believe they are so important in how we discuss God and scripture and how we can then relay this back to our lives. 
Number one, God is the maker of the world and everything in it. He created us as we're told in the biblical account of Genesis 1 and 2, and I will be holding to that. The word of God is true. It is infallible. It is the divine inspired work of the Holy Spirit. It is alive and it continues to move and be our anchor of truth for today. For most of you here, you likely hold to these statements. However, some of you might not hold to both of those. And some of you definitely most likely have children or grandchildren or relatives or loved ones who don't adhere to those truths. For some, the concept of the Bible being infallible may not be something you believe in currently. We live in a time when the concept of the absolute truth of the Bible is not always recognized. And so I find it important to outline where I will be speaking from. So this talk is not only for all of us here committed to those truths, but also to stir your heart on how you can have further conversations with those that God has put in your path who are already a part of your life or who maybe will be one day. And this is absolutely also for us. Together, as we desire to know Jesus more, to have God take us deeper into his presence and inspire us to keep walking with him in freedom and in love. At the end, I will be providing some resources for those who may want to dig a little bit deeper into elements of what we talk about, um, or even who may want to look for other items for their friends, their children, grandchildren, relatives, who are potentially struggling with some of these areas. So I'm going to just take a minute to pray um, before we get into the word. Let's pray. God, as we open your word and seek to understand you more, I pray that you will open our eyes. I pray that you will take us deeper tonight in our understanding of your word, as well as give us something new, something fresh, that helps us as we continue to walk on our journey with you. I pray also for those people who are currently in our lives and those who will cross our paths one day. May the thoughts we move through be able to come up in our conversations and relationships with others, as we seek to show others who you are. Amen. So going back to our cultural statement for today, the goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about yourself. We've already mentioned that this is something that we, we see all around us. We see it in media, TV. We see it with what our friends might say to us, with what family says. It's highly recognized and honored in our culture right now. We also all personally feel this pull. We all feel it in different ways, at different times, and in different seasons of our life. So we're going to dig into this piece of scripture that I have and spend some time on what Jesus says here. So this is Jesus' words. So if you want to turn in your Bibles, if you have them, to Matthew 16, verse 24. Jesus says, If anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will find it. For what will it benefit someone if he gains the whole world and yet loses his life? In the NIV version, it indicates... What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? So there's a contrast here when we're taking a look at this verse. He's letting us know first that we need to deny ourselves, that if we try to save our life, we will lose it. But if we lose it, we're going to find it. This contrast is uncomfortable. I find it uncomfortable. I've definitely found it uncomfortable at, at different times in my life. But regardless of whether or not we're comfortable with it, Jesus isn't making this soft or very easy or even very palatable. It's very black and white. He is clear. There's no wishy-washiness in how he's laying this out for us. Contextually, I think we can all see that Jesus is saying if we pursue things our way in this world, simply following our own heart, going back to those cultural statements, our own mind, 
our own desires, we will in fact lose our life. But if we lose our lives, finding them and abiding with Jesus, we will find life. I think we're recognizing the context of what Jesus is saying, but I believe one of the biggest questions that we need to ask ourselves here to understand this piece of scripture is why. Why is this so clear from Jesus? Why is there no wiggle room? Why is it black and white? To help sort out this question, I'm gonna take us all the way back to the beginning of creation. When God created, he tells us that it was good in Genesis one and two. We see in what he says in those chapters that it was, there was perfection. There was perfect unity, a perfect rhythm between God and man. There was no brokenness. No babies born with cancer, no global warming, no car accidents, no climate change, there was no rape, there was no human trafficking, no murder. There's a pastor that I'm sure a lot of you have heard of in the States, his name is Matt Chandler. Uh, A few years ago, he did a sermon entitled Recovering Redemption. And in here, he talks about just sort of this element of the fall. He says, in Genesis 1 and 2, there was perfect contentment in the Godhead. As an expression of his glory, God took joy in creating. God created, he created, he created, and it was good. If we read this in the Hebrew language, it reads rhythmically, like a song or a poem. We're introduced to this concept of perfect peace, which is another Hebrew word um, entitled shalom. So there was shalom, a perfect rhythm. If you think of this like music, you can understand this consistent, consistent rhythmic reality of shalom. God puts men and women together in the garden with free will and boundaries for this perfect rhythm, then there was a choice. The choice to go against God's boundaries, to go against this shalom. As we know, Adam and Eve took the choice in their God-given free will. And everything at this point fractures. It's outlined in Genesis chapter 3. At that moment, rebellion is declared against God and the cosmos fractures at every level. This perfect unity of the world, this perfect rhythm of life, this shalom is fractured. And I think we recognize that we're broken and that our relationship with God was severed, but I'm not always sure we recognize that that brokenness spans across all creation within every element. The natural order, the shalom, the perfection was fractured on every level. Our relationship to God, our relationship to others, our understanding of ourselves, our physical health, our climate, our earth, sexuality and the way we understand it was broken. And I don't think that we're actually dialed into this on the day to day. Like Job, kind of what Joel Pecora was referencing in the first session, we want to know why and we demand to understand. The realities that we live through sometimes don't make sense to us. But putting putting this reality of the fall back into our headspace allows us to recognize the time that we're living in right now the waiting for everything to be made back into this original perfection, back into this original rhythmic shalom. So let's go back now to our verse with sort of this context behind us. Jesus says that those who want to save their life will lose it. When we don't recognize the brokenness of our current reality, we don't see anything wrong with pursuing our own happiness. We don't fully recognize the way it was meant to be and the desire that God had originally intended for us. 
So what I'd like to do right now is spend some time just looking at a lot of the cultural ways that we practically, at times, will, will lose our life by trying to save it. This is going to look different for each of us. So these are just examples. Um, and it's going to look different because we're all different. And it's personal. This is personal. Culturally, there's a lot of things that this includes, lots of ways in which we try to get our satisfaction or our happiness. Money, power, education, status, sex, or being having sexuality, image, marriage, entertainment, for sure. But really, I think you could include anything here. And I'd like us to take a moment to look at this. Because the moment that anything becomes the goal over finding our satisfaction in Jesus, it is an illusion from where we are ultimately to find that fulfillment, that happiness. These are lies when taken out of context, and they are powerful. They get to us. Think about it for a moment. We all know the feeling of getting something or attaining something, believing that we will find happiness. There's a hold on our spirit there. There's a drive or a motivation or a push to really attain whatever it is. Once we've attained it, there are moments of what we believe to have somewhat of a contentment. Um, and then discontentment edges back in. And we continue to feel this powerful pull towards the next thing. The cycle continues and it continues. And we can sense this in ourselves. We can see this played out in our world and in the lives of other people. These are powerful things that are part of our everyday, and I want us to really think about it. Do we pay attention to that? Are we aware of this pull? Are we aware of when we start seeking satisfaction in these areas as opposed to Jesus? Many people spend their whole lives right here, attaining or chasing, um, not, fully understand, not fully understanding that they're looking for that in an area that was never meant to be their full satisfaction in the first place. Leaning into Jesus only for where we find true life. Because here is an important thing. Happiness and greatness in the scriptures is never based on any of those cultural items that I've mentioned, not once. So if we're looking at the totality of scripture, we're looking at happiness and greatness, it's never based on any of those items. So what if we stopped and intentionally looked at the motives of our heart, both big and small, leaning into Jesus only for where we find life? Jesus says, the one who is the greatest will be the least. Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn when they're persecuted. Blessed are those who are humble. Those who are humble will be exalted. And Jesus himself came to serve. The son of God came as a servant. It's important for us to remember the illusions that can so easily cover our eyes as a result of the fall as a result of that fracture, of that perfect peace, that perfect rhythm of creation. Once we see this, we can understand maybe a little more fully that Jesus is calling us to lose our life for him because he knows it's what's good for our soul, because of his love for us, and because of how he originally created us to live with him. He ultimately knows that this is where we find true life, and ultimately, eternal life, being in his presence always. Abiding and walking with Jesus is life in its truest form. So if we really believe this to be true, then it changes everything about our purpose and how we view happiness, what we pursue and how we pursue it, how we spend our time and what we think about. So I have some quotes. This one is two pages, but I'm going to read it because it's really good. So this is coming from a biblical scholar called Preston Sprinkle. 
He's a biblical scholar in the States, and he says, Christian discipleship is intrinsically eschatological. It's a super big word, and I nerd out to words like that a lot. Um, but eschatological basically means forward-facing. That is, a Christian vision of the good life is always oriented towards the future. We should never expect to find full satisfaction in this life. Everything about Christian obedience has an already not yet shape to it. This is not some hope for a pie in the sky future devoid of earthy materiality that we used to sing about in Sunday school. This is talking about a Christian life oriented towards a new creation where our fullest human potential will be realized. The Apostle Paul consistently contextualized the purpose and form of Christian living within this greater arc of the cosmic story of redemption. When properly focused, the biblical vision of our ultimate future is an empowering one in which our present sacrifices and struggles are put into that proper perspective. I know it's a lot of words. We cannot encourage people just to cling to this wreckage of life because of a future hope. On the contrary, the core of the Christian vision is that our lives now can enter into and reflect the realities of heaven. The current demand for fulfillment now is not a Christian demand. I don't know about you, um, but I don't want to be led by a lie or an illusion. And yet, I think there's so many times where we can be naive enough to believe that they're actually not as powerful as what they are because they're small or they don't actually take up that much attention from us. I have another quote here from a man named A.J. Swoboda. It's a fun name to say. He says, the tactics of the devil aren't always by overt power and coercion. Demons opt for the subtle, the titillating, the suggestive. More often, the spirits of this world operate by means of a soft power that beckons and whispers and suggests how naive we must be to even need church. Only weaklings need the church, they say. One pastor told me that the young have stopped coming to church because of sin, evil, and disobedience. But it's rarely that overt. Usually, they have been lured away from church on Sunday because of brunch, plain and simple. When it comes to the difficult work of getting out of bed, putting on clothes, and going to hear a message of sin and salvation, we'd rather have bacon, French toast, and an extra hour of sleep. God's people have traded in church for a mimosa. So I know that Swoboda here is speaking in relation to the church, However, this is just as rightly applied to our relationship with Jesus and the easy way our happiness and comforts can overtake our walking with him and living the life that he has created us for. I also want to say that I am definitely not saying this um, or quoting this to make us feel inadequate or ashamed or guilty or in any way to suggest that there's anything wrong with a good amount of French toast or bacon um, but I'd also like to say that the lies I've been speaking on aren't terrible in and of themselves necessarily, but they are terrible when we fully place them out of context. This now allows us to be able to enter into a conversation where we can be intentional, where we can allow God to unveil our eyes from these illusions and open them more towards his truth as we get to find our happiness in him both now and always with him. So, what's our goal of life? We get him. He is our goal. Jesus knows that nothing else will actually satisfy. He already knows this. So this is why he is clear. This is why there is no wiggle room. This is why it's super black and white. Lose your life in me and you will find it you will find your satisfaction. You will ultimately find where you were always meant to be. He's not hitting all those cultural statements. He's not saying, follow your own heart. He's not saying, do whatever makes you happy. He's not saying, you do you. Because he knows this isn't what is ultimately good for the flourishing of our spirit. 
God is good and he can't not be. He is good and he is love and he is faithful. He knows that we have, that having our soul continue to abide with him is the only place that we will fully be satisfied. So, as we look at wrapping up here, I want to go over this piece of scripture because I feel like it's such a powerful representation of this in many ways. So if you want to look this up in your Bibles, you can. It's in Colossians 1, verses 15 to 20. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and ultimately for him. He is before all things and by him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything back to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through the blood shed on the cross. So how do we do that? How do we do this? I really wish there was a three-step process for ensuring that we're abiding in Jesus. Um, the type A part of me would, would really love this, and it would be a lot easier to outline. But I want to suggest tonight that it would help for us to think about simply how in love with Jesus we are. How deep are we in the word? How much do we love his word? Because out of this, everything else will flow. Are we living life in love with him? And what are the things that we do to actually make that happen? For some people, maybe it works to have a plan that you include in your life to keep being in love with him. For others, the idea of having a plan or rules is like really against the grain of your spirit. So it might work best for you to call it a rhythm of how you walk with him. There's another quote the, from a pastor in the States called John, uh, named John Mark Comer. This is a really small quote, but I liked it. And it says, attention is the beginning of devotion. So fighting for this true happiness means that we're intentionally identifying where we actually place our devotion, our attention, and whether or not we're leaning into any of those lies for happiness or satisfaction first, before him. The Christian life is one in where we're act we have to always do this. We're surrendering, and then we're re-surrendering, and we're re-surrendering, sometimes moment by moment. But what we get then is real. It's not a fake lie or an illusion of where we were never meant to find our happiness. The real happiness that we get with him is never going to change. It's an anchor built on the one who created our spirit. So our goal is him. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this time tonight. Um, God, we pray that your word has moved and has been active um, in the hearts of us here. God, we pray that you are already going ahead um, as far as us continuing to, to move deeper in your word and deeper into the conversations of the people that we have around us that we love. God, we pray that you would help us to love you more, to focus on you first, and to seek you. Amen.